Amen. Good morning. <laughs> you know what? We've all come and just ready to receive from God. And as Brett said, uh, God's wanting something from us. But you know, there's an individual that came this morning expecting to be able to just sit back and relax and enjoy the, the, the service and the spirit. And we get here and our projectors are messed up. And I tell him that we work three hours on the video, which we may not have. We do, do we have the video? All right. His name's Brian Lawson. He's been running around here. He wanted to have church too. But he's been running around here trying to get the capabilities of some things that we, we use now at the church. And, you know, I definitely can preach without PowerPoint. I don't have to have it. And those that had me on Sunday night or, you know, you've seen me preach before, don't have to have it. But, but it's a ministry that God uses. And, and Brian has just totally took his service to use that talent. Uh, and, and I appreciate him for that. And I also appreciate Scott Kaiser who worked, we worked almost, he worked over three hours over this one little video that I'm going to show you. Uh, and, and so there's many people in the church today that we have. We're a very talented church. We've got people doing things. And, and when, when we do those things, we need to tell those people we appreciate them. Uh, and Lord, I need you. Facebook post by me not too long ago. I was listening to that song one morning. And I said, it's the same prayer 14 years later. Every morning I get up, it's the same prayer that I had at the altar that Sunday morning at Esterville Free Baptist Church. And it is, God, I can't do it anymore alone. And Jesus, every day, every hour that I live, I need you more than ever. Who this morning needs Jesus in their life? Amen. Okay, so this morning we're going to uh, continue on Make Me to Love You. And I've already got off track a little bit, but uh, <laughs> Make Me to Love You. Uh, or not Make Me to Love You, it's a long time ago. Uh, this is uh, Why We Love Jesus. Why we love Jesus. And these messages are for us to see who Jesus is and why he should captivate our heart our love and our devotion and today is just a powerful message we love him because he's full of grace and uh, this morning we have preached all these messages this summer series on why we love Jesus and I'm not going to go through those things but we have copies of those and they're also on the internet uh, and, and it's been a wonderful series and we probably have one more sermon to go uh, but this morning, I want to I want to just give you a personal story to get us into the into to what we're going to really be preaching on this morning. Uh, and by the way, you probably can't see as well over here. So if you want to move and shift, and everybody on this side, that's fine. If you if you really want to see the screen, but uh, we just have one. But here's a story. It's about two months ago that Roz went to the insurance company because I got a new vehicle and got rid of uh, t some and traded and. Uh, she went in the insurance company to, to change the insurance over. And she went and the insurance lady sitting at the desk looked up from her computer and said, did you not get the letter? And Ross said, what letter? She said, the letter from the, in the insurance. She said, no, I didn't get a letter. She said, oh, your insurance has been canceled for two or three months. Well, Ross come back and told me, and, you know, I was a little frustrated at first. I was like, well, how long have we went without car insurance? And the second question is, why in the world would they cancel our insurance? We've paid the payments. We've signed all the documents. And so then she got the letter, and it clearly explains why they dropped our... Now, we have insurance now, so, I mean, we just got... But why they dropped our insurance? And it sort of goes like this. One time, somebody backed into the car in a parking lot and had to pay for the damages of that car because he wasn't paying attention. I'm not going to name names. <laughs> but then we also backed into a pole. Someone did. I'm, I promise I wouldn't use names. And then someone also got two speeding tickets and one right here in big bold letters was 15 mile per hour plus. So they canceled our insurance because of the blemishes that we have. And then I thought about that and I said, well, wait a minute, that don't really make a lot of sense to me because that's why I buy insurance in the first place. You know, because we're reckless drivers, does that not keep food on some adjuster's table? Does that not keep people at work in the struggling economy? I mean, that's like having a doctor that only treats uh, healthy people. That's like going to a dentist with a sign on the front that says, no cavities welcome here. I'm so glad this morning that heaven never sends out letters like this. I want you to understand in heaven's program, it doesn't matter this morning how many blemishes, how many faults, and how many failures. It's got a coverage that covers it all because Jesus is full of grace. 
Amen. Let us stand this morning as we read God's word. John 1 and verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which are born not of blood, nor of will, but of the flesh, or nor of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but were born of God. Verse 14 is where we get our message. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. This morning, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity, God, to be able to stand. And we just ask that you'd help us, Lord, in this service. We know in last service, in this service, God, there's been spiritual warfare going on. And but Lord, we're not going to let Satan win. We plead the blood of Jesus today, God, over any hindrance to thy precious word. And we pray, God, as individuals that you would captivate our hearts, that we could just see Jesus as the instruments that's full of grace, And for the seasoned Christian today, God, let them be reminded of the grace of God that comes through Jesus Christ. And for those that are here that are lost today, let them see that Jesus is not just some grace, but he's full of grace. He's an ocean of grace that we can fall from any depth of sin and find relationship with you. God bless our time here today. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. You may be seated this morning, number one, the preface, and and, and let's really get into the story. The preface, what is a preface? Can anybody tell me what a preface is to a book? It's a little section before the book, right? And the preface tells us what the author, what, what, what it moved, whatever he wrote, how it moved upon the author. And number two, the preface tells us the main point that the author's trying to make. So when you read John and one in your personal study, understand that John's writing the preface to the rest of the book. And in this preface, he's making one important point. And that point is that Jesus is a divine being from God. He is God in the flesh. Now, to to illustrate that this morning, my banana, see, everything's just sort of trying to decay this morning. But that's all right. He's the giver of life, right? Uh, But to illustrate that, if you take your finger down the seeds of a banana, right down the middle, how many parts, Jordan, does it go into three now you can eat this later when the message gets long won't you three parts is it still one banana still made of the same material still the same genetics still is one but how many parts three we believe that God is three and one we believe there's a trinity and we believe that in the same essence in the same genealogy or uh, in the same DNA in the same genetic makeup as one that there is God the Father God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are three different parts of the same being, and they're all as one. And so who we're talking about, who John's talking about, is one part of that trinity. And he's saying that this Jesus was, has the same genetics, the same makeup, is as one as God, but yet took that revelation and that makeup, that character, and brought it down into the form of flesh. He shelled the form of God in the form of simple human man, you and I, okay? And so that represents what John's trying to say. It is the divine Jesus who is working in the flesh of man, okay? And so then he says, and I want you to look at the scripture, and I, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because uh, I, I want to get to the main points, but in verse 12, he says, as many as received him, now that's a regulation of the gospel. Received him means more than a head knowledge. It means more when I was at the age of 12, I said, I believe it's true. Received him means that I came to, the, to one point sometime in my life and I said, Jesus, not only do I believe it is true, but I accept you as Lord. I surrender my heart and life to you. And the Bible says, regulation number one, unless you come to the point of greater the knowledge of it being true, unless you come to the point that you make him Lord and master of your life, devoting your life to him, then the Bible says he cannot do the second thing. But when we receive him, the regulation is met and he will give you the power to become the son and the daughter of Almighty God. That's what he says, all right? In verse 13, he says, these individuals were born, not of will by their own will, okay? Now, it means, born here means a new birth, a new life, a new existence. And so what he's saying is they had a new birth, a second birth. They were born again. 
And he says it was not by the will of their own selves that they did works. They went to church. They preached. They did all these things. That had nothing to do with it, God says. But John says that in this verse that they were born of the will and the power of Almighty God. A supernatural new birth, new life in Jesus. Regulation number two this morning. I cannot be saved. I am not saved. I do not have a relationship with God unless I have a second and a new birth. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven and then he gets to the point so who is the he that he's talking about he is the word that is the pre-eternal that is the eternity past title of Jesus as three and one Jesus was made flesh as I showed you and dwelt among him and we beheld we were revealed to us who God is and so he's saying, I love all these things, but understand this, the reason I love Jesus, yes, he is that essence of God who took on the shell of a man, but more than that, understand that this Jesus is full, he's overflowing, there's plenty enough grace for you and I. So now let's get to, to point number one. If somebody come up to you today and said, you're a Christian, what does grace mean? Could you answer that? What does grace mean? Let me give you the, the, the points of the gospel and then we'll, we'll get to that. But number one, the points of the gospel say this, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means everybody on God's green earth has messed it up. Everybody on God's green earth has a record of blemishes. The Bible says there's none that doeth good, no, not one. So each and every one of us has a record of blemishes in the sight of God. So I'm going to ask you to say with me, all have sinned. Ready? All have sinned. All right, second point of the gospel. Then what is it that sin does to our life? Sin not only makes us bad, but sin makes us dead. Now what I mean by that is this. Sin not only affects the life of the human being, but sin will infect the being of the human. You get that? It will infect, it will contaminate the whole being from the head to the feet of the human. Sin makes us not bad, but dead. It's kind of like this. If this little flower were in the soil and I took these clippers and I cut that flower, I have cut it off from its life source. Well, the next day it's still going to look pretty good. And then a few days after that though, it's going to begin to look something like this. It's going to die. It's going to wither and fade away. Because we have cut it off from the life source that feeds its life. And so when we look at that, I can take this little flower. Uh-oh, my sister, are you in here? I'm sorry. She cleans the church. I can take this flower. I can tape it. I can mold it. I can do whatever I want to do with it. But this flower, when it's cut off, is, is destined for death. I want you to realize this morning, playing around with sin, it's the same concept. The first day or so, or the first week or so, or for some time, there may be pleasure in sin, but sin cuts us off from the life source. And you may find pleasure in sin for a season, but get this image in your head, because when sin is done, sin makes us dead in our soul, in our spirit to Almighty God, and then it begins to spill out into the other avenues of our life. Sin makes us dead. Can you say that with me? Ready? Sin makes us dead. And then the third point is that because of this sin, it has cut our soul off from the life giver, that being Almighty God. And so the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means today if I said, okay, to get back to God, everybody stand there here, we're going to jump up and high-five the ceiling. Guess what? Everybody can't do it. Some will jump higher than the others. It's impossible. And so that tells us this morning when sin is unconfessed and uncovered by the blood of Jesus, it cuts us off from Almighty God and creates a great distance that we can never span and we can never cover. That's the gospel. And so then it sets up a dilemma. The dilemma is this. In my heart and in my soul and in my nature, there's, even though my soul is dead to God, and, and we can understand why people can do vile acts and still sleep at night because you see their soul's been cut off and hardened by sin and it's dead to God. And so, but all that time, my soul still thirsts. My soul still hungers to know my creator, to be in a relationship with him. You see. 
And so it puts a conflict within me because I'm on the inside, I'm so desiring to know God and be saved and, and live a life for Christ, but on the other hand in my flesh, I know that I'm dead to God. Sets up a dilemma. Are you with me this morning? It's quiet, man. The dilemma of sin. You know, I can go to this insurance company and I can say, you know what, I don't think it's right. I didn't like you cancel my insurance. I, I don't think that's right. But you know what? I know in my heart it was the right thing for them to do. Because I stand guilty, and Roz mostly, I mean, uh, we both <laughs> stand guilty before the insurance company of reckless driving. And point number one on this letter all insurance companies have certain guidelines to determine whether or not to continue to provide insurance. All insurance companies must have a standard. And if you go against that standard, then they must take action. And for me to say, would you just forget about what we've done and keep our insurance? In reality, they can't do that because if they forget and forgive my wrongdoing and my blemishes, then they've got to do it for everybody. And so then there would be no standard for us to be compared to. And the company will lose the integrity of its standard. And the second reason is this. If they didn't keep those standards, then there'd be no reinforcement to get people to, not, to live lives of not having reckless driving, you see. There'd be no reason to change. We just back into anybody. We go 90 mile an hour. I mean, if there was no standard, then there'd be no uh, behavior change in our own lives. Now, let me give you the biblical basis on that. The dilemma of sin is this. We know that we all stand guilty before God this morning. We all have a list of blemishes. And for me to be selfish and to say, God, forgive this and uh, forget about this, would be to ask a holy God to change his attitude on sin and then to ask him to lose the integrity of his standard that he will deal with sin 100% of the time. We do not want as human beings today to have a world that has no God without an integrity of standard where there is no right and there is no wrong for then there would be chaos in the social structure of all human beings. So to ask God to forget about my offenses and my blemishes is against his very nature and his attitude towards sin. And the second part of the dilemma is if God didn't take a stance on sin, if sin didn't cut me off from his fellowship, if sin did not affect my life in any bit, then it would be no hope for us to seek a life separate from sin. There'd be no hope for us to find a new life where we are delivered from the power of sin. So there's a dilemma today. And that dilemma is this. Holiness demands God's action on sin because he's a holy God. But mercy calls for God's love of the sinner. Can we, can we get into that? So number one, why should I be here today thinking God's going to excuse my sin? I don't want God to excuse my sin. I want God to be God and be the standard of right and wrong. But I also want to find a life in which sin does not have power and control me any longer. So where's the answer, Pastor? How do we answer this? The answer is grace. The answer is grace. You say, Brother Scotty said it, it's unmerited kindness, it's undeserved favor. Well, let me explain to you exactly what grace is. Uh, the insurance company comes to me uh, and they say, okay, uh, TJ, we found somebody. Stand up, Brother Jody, and get your... We found somebody that has no blemishes on their driving record. They're perfect. They are perfectly clean. The other side, there you go. And here's your blemishes. But this one, I say, well, good for them. Pin a rose on their nose, you know. <laughs> they say, yeah, but you don't understand. This individual has said, let me take on the name of Rosalind and TJ. And let me take their record. And I'll give them my perfect record. Spot clean. I say, wait a minute, who is this person, you know? How much do I owe them? And the insurance company says, no, it's completely free. Wow, that's grace, ain't it, brother? Let me give you the biblical basis of that. That means today that grace, other than the name of Jesus, 
is the most powerful word in all the Bible. That means today without grace, if I didn't taste the grace of God, I couldn't preach. Without grace, we ought to shut the doors to the church because we have no ministry. We cannot understand who God is until we completely understand what grace is this morning. And we get so used to God and we get so used to God's forgiveness and we stroll on into church and we act like we deserve to be there. We act like we deserve to have our seat. We act like that we bless God just because we showed up because we forget the power and the effect of the grace of God. I tell you, God, I didn't bless God by being here. God blessed me by allowing me to be a worshiper of him. And so this is what it means. It means to me today that God's attitude uh, towards sin has been justified. It means that God has been satisfied towards sin because it was Jesus who took on my wrath and my punishment to, for the Bible says, for he was made to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. He satisfies God's wrath and then on the other hand, he gives me the ability to have a new life, to not live any longer controlled by my sin, to live a life where the Bible says if any man be in Christ, praise God, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away and old things become new. I don't deserve that today and neither do you. It's the fact this morning that with all my blemishes that Jesus Christ has died and then he has said, let me have their record of all the offenses towards God and I will take on their record and I will take on their name and you give them my record and you give them my name to where I, T.J. McCamus, a sinner, can stand in prayer before a holy God and him look down upon my life and not see the offenses of my past but him look down on me today and see nothing but the name of Jesus and nothing but the record of Jesus I tell you the best thing that I've ever done is I took off the old coat of sin and I put on the new and Jesus changed me I can stand justified and holy and without sin before God I don't deserve that and neither do you. Can I say, can we not just celebrate Jesus' grace? Brother Thurston, you don't deserve that. Brother Lee, you don't deserve that. We don't deserve to even be in this church, but by the grace of God, he sees the name of his son upon my life. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for your grace. I don't care if you've been saved 25, 30, 40 years. When you get to the place that grace don't move you, you're in a bad place with God. Never stop celebrating God's grace because you don't deserve it. Now let me get closer to the end here. And I don't deserve it. Who are the enemies of God's grace? Real quickly. The enemies of God's grace... The Bible says that for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. So who is it this morning that frustrates the grace of God? Who is it this morning that are enemies to the grace of God? It's those this morning who reject that grace. Preacher, am I an enemy to the grace of God? Number one, the hedonist is an enemy to the grace of God. Who is the hedonist? It is the pleasure-seeking individual who this morning will be willing to trade eternal life for the life of pleasure today. It's the individual this morning who says to their own self, I can't give up this lifestyle, I can't give up this, and I can't give up that. And so because of that, they reject the grace of Almighty God. And the Bible says, what would a man give in exchange for his soul? And in reality today, though God is showing his grace to be a pleasure-seeking individual who, who rejects God because of that lifestyle is one who lives in open rebellion and an enemy to the grace of God just the same as a Christian who's been saved for years and has now decided to go back into the life and the things of the world. You are not only uh, being an enemy to the grace of God, but you're frustrating. You are frustrating the grace of God. The second enemy to the grace of God is the judge 
The person who said, okay, let's jump and get the ceiling. I can jump higher than Brother Jason. I got that much higher. Well, we didn't get to the ceiling. We didn't get to God, but I'm closer to God than Jason because I jumped higher. My life's better than Jody. I didn't do the things Jody did. I've been in church for 30 years. I came to church as a five-year-old. I didn't do the things Scotty did. So I'm closer to God. When we come to the foot of the cross, there's no one a greater saint and no one a greater sinner. We're all equal and we're all sinners at the foot of the cross. But those who think, because my life is better than the next, are those who are enemies to the grace of God, number three. Those who think because I do good works, I give my money to the poor because I'm TJ and I preach sermons on Sunday because I do these things. Oh, God's being pleased with me. I'm just getting a little bit closer to God. Those who think that by their works that they're being saved. Many people treat the grace of God like a paycheck. I'll give back from God what I can put into God. It's kind of like the young man. He woke up. And the alarm went off and he didn't hear it like a lot of you guys. Like, br- like Brother Dalton over there. No. I can't sleep past 9 o'clock. It bothers me, Sean. Huh? Now some people can sleep a long time. Anyways, the alarm clock went off and he didn't hear it. Man, he had a meeting though in 30 minutes. He had to catch a ferry to go across to the other side of the, to the city. So he jumps up and he's getting dressed and he's running out. He's got his briefcase over one shoulder and his jacket on the other. He's putting his tie on. He's fixing his belt and he hears, whoop, whoop. He said, oh no, there goes the ferry. And he looks down and the ferry's just a few yards from the dock. He says, I can make it. I can do it. And he takes off running with the coat and the belt and the, and the, and the, and the tie. And he jumps as hard and as fast as he can jump. And as he jumps, he swore he could hear the, the tune to Chariots of Fire, you know, And he hits the boat and he rolls and he hits the back and he jumps up and his shirt's ripped and his nose is bloodied and he's got bruises and and dirt all over him and he says, whoa, I made it. Did you guys see that? And it was that awkward moment, you know, that you text about because the captain looks over and says, son, the boat wasn't going out. The boat was coming in. Isn't that the way we are with God's grace? Isn't that the way we are with God's grace? I think I've got to get better, do right, change my life before I come to God. And I'm working so hard to try to jump to God. And God said, I'm bringing the boat to you. I'm bringing salvation to you. And all you've got to do is accept Jesus Christ. And so I come to my last point. Are you with me this morning? My last point. It's not only is Jesus grace, but Jesus is full of grace. He's overflowing of grace. And, and you see, the last enemy of God's grace is the person who's pleasure-seeking and, and rejects God's grace. It is the person who tries to distract God by looking at the lives of others. And it is the person who thinks they can fool God by trying to work at their own salvation. But the last enemy of grace in my life was my own self. My own self that questioned whether I could live it. My own self that questioned whether I could truly be accepted anymore. I got a video clip. You say we got it? This video clip is Dr. Splash. It's a little different. We don't have sound with it. It's all right. It's a little different. I want to see if we got it. Oh, we got it. This will be 38 feet drop. Okay? 38 foot. 38 feet. 38 feet that he'll drop. Oh, I missed it. Here he goes. Boom. See that? Look at that, 38 feet. Man, you say, okay, how'd he do that? There's a blow-up mattress with a little bit of water in it, and uh, there's a, there is a therapeutic mattress underneath it, okay, and then a slab of concrete. So how did he get up? How did he make it through that? He knew that if he went feet first, he would die. If he went head first, he would die. He knew, if you watched the video, that he had to go all in and totally free fall into that pool. 
Pastor Lou Giglio actually seen it in per- person, and he spoke about this, and, and this is where I got this thought. He said, that is such a great example of a sinner falling into God's grace. Because he said as he climbed the ladder, people were ooh and ah, but when he got to the top, he said nobody was saying a word. Is he really going to do this? That's impossible. That little pool of water will never hold him. And Pastor Giglio said this, it reminds me of those who are lost. And they see that great mountain of shame. And they see that great mountain of blemishes. And that great mountain of hurt. And they get, as I did so many times, to the edge. They get on top of those things and they know that God can deal with those things. And they get on top of that and they look down to God's grace. And because the distance seems too great, seems too risky, they step away and they turn away from the grace of God. Oh, it's so powerful. Because I... I find the message for the church today. You want to know why lost people don't like church? Because they know that in most churches, if they come in with their brokenness and their shame, and they come in with all their blemishes, they may find 11 inches of grace, but they're going to find feet of condemnation from church people. And when they do that, Their heart's broken in a thousand pieces and they don't need any more hurt. So why go to church and get judged and condemned in their broken lives and their shame that they've had to get on top of and deal with? They don't need to hear from somebody else how bad they are. But yet in the church, in the church as a whole, we continue to take this this mindset and this disposition that we're holier than now and we look down and are pointing fingers and we condemn and people look at us and they have to cross over us just to get to Jesus. I tell you, Mount Olive, let us understand that at the foot of the cross, we're all sinners. Bottom line, period, that's the end. And God's grace is sufficient. Let us send the message to Wise County, to the drunk, to the adulterer, to whoever it is that understand that God's grace is sufficient for you. That's the message of Mount Olive today. And if you're a member of this church and you can't do that, then maybe you need to pray because maybe God needs your seat. It's about God's grace. Hurting world with hurting lives need to know that if they take that step and fall into Jesus, that there is grace enough to embrace them, to help them, to forgive them, and to change them for all eternity. So now as I come to a close, I'm speaking directly to those who right now in this service, you know that you've got blemishes, you know that you've got hurt, You know that you've got shame and you've come to this point once more. You've been here before and you've turned and you've walked away. And right now you feel God speaking into your heart and you've come to this point right here again. And you're looking down and you're saying, oh, pastor, I don't know the uncertainty. Pastor, you don't know the blemishes in my life. Pastor, you don't know there's no way I can live it and you are refusing to step out. How do you know that, Pastor? Because I've been there. You talk about a boy who was raised in church and now he's calling to preach at the age of 12. And then got out of church, lived an ungodly lifestyle, hard on church, and I've shared this before. I rededicated several times and still went back on God into the work. Sin had a hold on me. And you don't think it was hard that Sunday morning? Another time to step out and say, God, I need your grace. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. But it was the best thing because I found that Jesus is full of of grace. You say, Pastor, you don't know the junk that's in my trunk. You don't know the blemishes behind my closed doors. Nobody knows. And God can't deal with those today. The Bible says in Romans 5 and 20, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin did abound, grace much more abound. That means when it's sin versus grace, God's grace is always above. 
When it's sin versus grace, God's grace will always win. No matter how high that sin takes you up that ladder, no matter the distance of how far that sin takes you away from God, it doesn't matter to God forever how far sin takes you. The power of God's grace is enough to go and find you and bring you back to Him. And so for that one this morning, God, I pray that you speak right now. For that one this morning that's standing on the edge and really wants to take that leap of faith and go all into Jesus, to fall all into Jesus. The message is this today, that there's not just a kiddie pool of grace in Jesus, there is an ocean of grace. You say, Pastor, how do you know? I find a woman who's caught in the act of adultery. They said, stone her in Jesus. Said, he without the sin, let him cast the first stone. And then Jesus said, now woman, go and sin no more. And Jesus accepted her and loved her and gave her grace and changed her life. I see a woman called Mary Magdalene, demon possessed and nobody could do anything with her. She fell at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus, by grace, with the most vile individual, he changed her life to where she was accepted among the brotherhood of the disciples, to where she was the very first person to see Jesus resurrected from the grave, a demon-possessed woman changed by the grace of Almighty God. Oh, don't think you're too far. I see the publicans and the sinners, the drunkards, that Jesus said and ate meat with and those Pharisees of the church who didn't believe in God's grace come and said, what's he think he's doing? Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. So I'm going to tell you this morning, you need a change in your life and God is speaking right now and you're standing on the edge like I did so many times and maybe your distance is here, maybe it's further. I don't know where it's at but you're standing there and you're looking at Jesus Christ and you just don't know if you can take that step. I want to tell you, bring all your offenses, all your blemishes this morning and just fall into Jesus by a step of faith and you will find what I found, that Jesus will not condemn you, he will not judge you, but Jesus will love you and bring unmerited kindness and change your life dramatically this morning. As they come to the piano, Sister Sarah, you say, well, preacher, I've been a member of this church and you're preaching greasy grace. We can live any old way we want to, but God's grace is still an ocean of grace. His grace is. But let me tell that individual, that seasoned Christian this. Have you fully took the step <laughs> You're a seasoned Christian. Have you fully stood at the point that I stood and many others have stood uncertain about the distance of God's grace and went headlong into Jesus? Because if you had, you know that when you fall into Jesus' grace and you realize you're unworthy and you're undeserving and that His grace is sufficient, then you realize that you don't want to do anything to shame that grace in your life. If you've stepped into Jesus like I've stepped into Jesus, then your life will change because you'll know that you're unworthy and you'll begin to live a life that don't want to shame His name and don't want to disgrace His grace. And your life will change. That's grace. His grace changes me. And I begin to live a life that is different because I'm so unworthy. He would love me that much and catch me when I fall. The dangerous point is when a Christian gets to the point that they know they're shaming the grace of God and they make that decision to continue to do that lifestyle. And then Satan's got a hold on them and he has taken away the power of the grace of God in their life and they're headed for a place of hardness on God. And if that's you this morning, 
and you know you're disgracing the grace of God, I beg you, I urge you today, come back to Jesus. Fall back on Jesus. Let that grace be renewed so your life will be changed and no longer young person and no longer mom and dad. Do you disgrace the act and the work of grace that Jesus has done in your life? We dedicate and renew. God has moved on me in this message. As we bow our heads, here this morning I just want to tell you on the inside you've got hurt, you've got shame you've got blemishes and you've never fully gave it to Jesus I want you to know one thing right off the bat God loves you with a radical eternal amazing love right now and I want you to know until you step out of self until you step out to Jesus and be born again You will not know God and you will not be a son or daughter of God. But if you would just step out today, I promise you that Jesus, I love Him because He is full of grace. He will change your life right now. Jesus stands right now with a brand new life and a brand new record. And He says it's yours. Jesus stands with a brand new life and a brand new record with his name stamped on the top. And he says, right now it's yours. But all you have to do is take the courage to fall to Jesus and he will change you and save you and deliver you from a devil's hell. As I say this prayer, I'm going to ask the prayer altar people to sneak up here. Father, I'm so thankful for your grace. We pray that you would renew that grace in each and every one of us today. Because we do not deserve you. Forgive us of the times, God, where we think that we are blessing you by some part of our life. And renew that we are so undeserving. And for that one right now, God, they're on the edge. Oh, they're on the edge. Let them know right now that Jesus is full of grace. And if they'll just take that step and say, Jesus, forgive me my sins and be Lord of my life. If they'll just take that step, they'll find right now what their soul is truly thirsty for. In the name of Jesus, amen. As we stand, every head's bowed. Would you sing, Sister Sarah? Right now, no one's looking around. Take that step. If somebody's beside you, just say, excuse me. Take that step. God, you need Jesus, you need to rededicate Christian, you need to rededicate complete 
this time we want to ask if there be anyone in the house uh, that's been saved and would also like to follow up in baptism. We have extra towels, but would there be anyone else in the house that would like to be baptized? Amen. It's a joyful thing this morning to... And I know this morning you say, gosh, it seems like we're having a baptizing every Sunday. Yes. Church, let's don't get none to that. Amen. As tomorrow's church comes in, we'll... Baptism is a symbol this morning that we have believed that Jesus died for our sins and went into the grave. It is a symbol that we believe that Jesus has rose from the grave. And in that same manner, we have died to ourselves, and in Jesus we're living a new life. In the early church, when, when people were baptized, we must understand that they were then to face persecution, sometimes death. So in the early church, to be baptized was... Was, was an extremely important thing that you were recognizing your life and your purpose was all under the name of Jesus. Do you believe Jesus died for your sins? Do you believe that He rose from the grave? Have you accepted Him as Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to pray. And when I get done praying and say amen, I'll give you a second. Come on, hold your nose you can. And we'll just take you down back in the back room. And Brother Jody and Brother Scotty will bring you right back up. Okay? okay. Let us pray. Amen. Father, we're so thankful for the faith of a young child. We're so thankful, Lord, that you knew her in her mother's womb. Yes, Lord. For this purpose, God, you created her. And now, Lord, if she's got a relationship with you, we pray that as she grows, that God, she'd never forget. Yes, Lord. That she is, Lord, a daughter of the Most High God. Yeah, God. And wherever she carries yes, your name, let her carry it with pride, but with boldness, God, that she Always. can reach out to others. We pray for her family now, God, yeah, that in God. her home, that you'd help them train her, Lord, in the ways of you. We're so thankful now. We do with pleasure, God, to your glory. Baptize our new sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 This is Autumn Miller, for those that don't know. This was the individual that we spoke about in that testimony that was so moving not too many weeks ago. How that through a stroke, God touched her. And then after that, God touched her spiritually. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Autumn, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Yes. Do you believe that he rose from the grave? Yes. Have you accepted him as Lord and Savior? Amen. Father, we're so thankful for our sister yeah, Autumn. God, thank you, Lord. Oh, the power of her testimony. <laughs> yes, Lord. 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 And God, what you're doing, we pray, God, that you would take that testimony and her boldness, God, Lord, to every bless. life that comes in contact yeah, with her. God. That others will know that Lord, you are bless. still God and you still work wonders, but Lord, most bless. of all, God, you still touch us spiritually. We're so thankful yes. for Autumn and we now with... God, with pleasure to your glory, we now baptize our new sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Hey, mama. <laughs> Sister, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Yes. Do you believe that he rose from the grave? Yes. If you accept him as Lord and Savior. Amen. After I get done praying, you hope you're done. Father, we're so thankful for what you're doing, God, in this family. Lord, you can work where no man can hinder. And God, we're so thankful for our new sister's faith, God, and we pray that, Lord, that you would begin to develop within her, Lord, a strong relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord. That you would let her know, God, by this symbol today, that she is and will always be a daughter of the Most High God. And we baptize our new sister now, Lord, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 This time, we're going to ask again, would there be anyone that would also like to follow in baptism? This is Gracie. Gracie? Gracie. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Amen. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the grave? Have you accepted him this morning? Amen. I get done praying, you can hold your nose, okay? Lord, we're just so moved by your presence this morning. And God, we're so thankful for little Gracie's boldness. God, to step up this morning in the following Lord, baptism. God, help us as adults, God, have that same boldness. Yes, Lord. We pray, Lord, in Gracie's little life, that God, you would make her bold, that she would be an agent of change, God, in her generation. That she would be one of your disciples, God, with all of her friends and her classmates as she grows old, that... God, she would help others come to know the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We now baptize our new sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Brother Gary, if you put us on some music, uh, at this time this concludes our services. We have another Come on. Amen. Accept him as Lord this morning. I sure did. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we're so thankful, Amen. God. Oh, the boldness of Hannah this morning, God, not only to step out <laughs> and to fall upon you, Jesus, but also, Father, to follow up immediately, God, with baptism. We're so thankful. And we pray, God, that right at this moment, that you would never let Hannah forget that she is now a daughter of the Most High God. And we pray. That whoever's connected to her life, God, her Lord, friends please. and family, that God, you put within her, Lord, a desire to, to Lord, share Lord, Jesus please. with them through her experience and, and through your grace, that God, she may win others for the cause of Christ. We now baptize our new sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Anyone else is more?